time to move on now. Uh, okay, I think our next speaker does not really need any more introduction. Uh, you can see that he's the organizing chairman for this workshop. And uh, I think we all know Dr. Selva is a consultant, obstetrician, and gynecologist and subspecialist in reproductive medicine at, at Makota Melaka. He heads the IVF Center and Hypo Center at the respective hospital. He received his initial training in laparoscopic surgery under Prof. Sung King Yong and Dr. Lee Chai Lung at the Changun Primary Hospital, Taipei, in 1994. He's also the past president of MAPH and also Obstetric and Gynecology Society of Malaysia, and is involved in promoting gynecology and endoscopy surgery in Malaysia. He started the first high food center in Malaysia in 2021. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Selva. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bala. Okay, my talk is infertility with adenomyosis. How can HIFU help? Now, I feel very small talking after Professor Wang Wu and uh, uh, Hogi. They have been doing this for many, many years. I've only been doing for 16 months, that's all. But uh, I have a vast experience doing laparoscopic surgery for last 28 years, IVF for last 24 years. So I thought I can bring that experience performing laparoscopic surgery and IVF into HIFU and see how we can incorporate HIFU into our practice uh, as infertility specialists. Okay, let me see. Okay, now my disclosure is, as you all know, I run a HIFU-based, uh, ultrasound-based HIFU center at Makuta Medical Center, Malacca. Now, what are the types of adenomyosis? Now, when, how do we make a diagnosis of adenomyosis? The first thing is we do ultrasound. And we say that adenomyosis is either a diffuse adenomyosis, a focal adenomyosis. Sometimes they call it an adenomyoma. And this is a very good book by my friend, Dr. Felix Wong. If you have the time, you can read it about adenomyosis. They talk about all, all aspects of adenomyosis. Now, if you look at this diagram, you can see that generally we say a, a woman will have adenomyosis if one of the uh, part is larger than the other. I mean, this is so more swollen than this. Then we say, okay, this looks like an adenomyosis. If you can't see a, a very well circumscribed fibroid, that is going to be an adenomyosis. But there are many other things that are there uh, in an ultrasound diagnosis of adenomyosis. You could see small, a little, uh, what we call a cyst inside that area. You can see legs, and these are fan like lesions. You can see uh, defects in the junctional zone some blood vessels here, and these are uh, defects and absence of um, uh, interrupted junctional zone. So these are how people describe adenomyosis on ultrasound. Now, in, in MRI, things are much more different. You have something called diffuse adenomyosis, internal adenomyosis, external adenomyosis, and adenomyoma. And if you look at the classifications here in MRI, you can see that A, B, C are what we call as uh, internal adenomyosis. The adenomyosis actually starts at the junctional zone and moves upwards, outwards, and it can be as bad as involving a large part of the uterus. And here you see a large part of the uterus. These are um, what we call as internal adenomyosis. Then you can have adenomyomas. Adenomyomas can be on different areas. Yeah. Oh, all right, sorry. Okay, I will start. My previous slides, did you all see that? The previous, this one, the previous slide was okay. Yeah? So I'll go back again. You can see that there's A, B, C, D, E. These are called internal adenomyosis. The adenomyosis actually starts from the center of the cavity and move outwards. This is one of the uh, pathophysiology of adenomyosis where it is uh, starting from inside, moving out into the uh, myometrium. And this is the, the type that is de described as internal adenomyosis. And then we have adenomyoma. Adenomyomas can be either intramural like this, it can be submucous, sub, uh, submucous or it can be subserous. 
Then we have the external adenomyosis. Here, the adenomyosis comes from the serosa and moves into the endometrial cavity. So generally, there are, these are the three different pathophysiology for adenomyosis. So we need to understand that because when we are doing HIFU, um, the different diseases, the response is different, as I will, I will describe. It is completely different because the, the disease occurrence is different. Okay, now, why is this not moving? Now, oh, how do I move this? What did you do? Okay, all right, okay. So those with adenomyosis, when we look, when I see patients with adenomyosis, there are two groups of patients. One patient are those with adenomyosis who do not want to conceive, but want to retain their uterus. And the second group are adenomyosis who want to conceive. In this particular lecture, I will be concentrating on this group, those with adenomyosis who want to conceive. Those are the ones who have a problem of infertility. So for those who want to conceive, what are the options we have? we can do adenomyomectomy. And you all know that adenomyomectomy is not a very easy operation. It's always a very difficult operation. We always don't know whether we have excised enough. We always worry about uterine rupture after the patient has undergone surgery. So it's not a very easy operation. I've got a full lecture on this particular topic on adenomyomectomy. The second is we give GNRH analog or we give Dinogest and we hope for the best. And then hopefully we'll stop that and the patient can conceive either with a spontaneous pregnancy or with frozen embryo transfer. This is, this is all the options that we have of this uh, in patients who want to conceive. So what about HIFU? What are the benefits? I think we have seen this. We know that it's non-invasive. When shrinkage of adenomyosis occurs, the uterus will become smaller and it probably will be more amenable for pregnancy. That's, that's what we are hoping for when we uh, uh, do HIFU for adenomyosis. There is a reduction of symptoms, namely menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea. The patient can start trying to conceive after about four months of treatment. The patients can even have a normal delivery after the treatment because there's no scar in the uterus. That's a big benefit of uh, 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 high flu for adenomyosis. Now, what is my experience? And I've been, I've been doing for the last about 16 months and I've done 311 cases, out of which about 112 adenomyosis and the remaining are fibroids and, and uh, fibroid and adenomyosis. So I'm basing my... Um, talk on this experience of performing um, high flu for adenomyosis patients. Now, you will be seeing this center tomorrow um, uh, during the tour. It's a small room with the, with the JC200 machine. Okay, then I'll move on to the next slide. So, what are the principles of high flu ablation? Now, Ablating fibroids is different from ablating adenomyosis. Now, let me explain why. Now, you can see that there is a, this is a fibroid. A fibroid has got a nice round capsule around it. And this is a contrast MRI showing the fibroid with a nice uh, uh, capsule. And when we do the ablation, we can contain the energy within this fibroid. You can see there are two fibroids. So we can, I can do the ablation and contain it. And we can get 70, 80, 90%, sometimes even 100% of the fibroid, we can get it because fibroid has got a capsule and the energy is contained within the capsule. This is not the same for adenomyosis. And you can see adenomyosis is all over the place. You can see here, it's everywhere. And as what uh, Dr. Hoagie was mentioning, you have to worry about the serosa, you have to worry about the endometrium. So it's, it's not as straightforward to ablate an adenomyosis compared to a fibroid. So very, very challenging. And you can see that I've done the ablation here uh, and I have to be uh, careful. And this is especially so if a patient is trying to get pregnant. If the patient does not want to get pregnant, I'm very happy to do because I can ablate as much as possible. I can involve the endometrium. But when a patient wants to get pregnant, I have to be very careful when I do ablation. So the ablation is te uh, technique is completely different. So the difference in performing HIFU for patients who want to conceive and not to conceive is different. So in a patient, who do not want to conceive, you can do extensive ablation and you can perform even include the endometrium. It doesn't matter. And the success rate for reducing symptoms is higher. Many of these patients come to see us for benorrhagia and, and bleeding. And also they want to get pregnant. So this is when the problem comes in. So when the patient wants to conceive, ablation needs to be done more carefully to avoid ablating the endometrium. In this case, the ablation will be limited and the success in reducing symptom will be lesser and less energy will be given to the adenomyotic area. So this is my experience because 
when we're doing for patients who want to get pregnant, um, their success rate in reducing menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea will be limited because of the limitation, limit, uh, because of the constriction I have, constraints I have in giving energy into the uterus. So I think this is, a, this is an important point. So what are the challenges of ablating adenomyosis? Not all adenomyosis cases are the same. In some, there is a gap between the adenomyosis and the endometrial cavity. And these are the external adenomyosis, as I told you, because the adenomyosis is coming from outside. It rarely reaches the junctional zone. It rarely reaches the endometrium. So you can ablate um, quite close and avoid the endometrial cavity. But in others, the adenomyosis reaches the endometrial cavity and it breaches the transformation zone. Here, it can, it can very easily reach the endometrial cavity. The energy must be given in low and controlled manner, and it, you can quickly reach the endometrial cavity. And you will see this when you come to watch me doing the case, because sometimes you can't see whether the energy has reached the endometrial cavity. It's impossible to see. The grayscale is not there to show you that, and that is a, that is a challenge. But I also wonder if the endometrium has already been involved by the adenomyosis, so what if you treat it? So what if you ablate it? Let the endometrium die and new endometrium form. Is that a good? Is that a correct concept? I don't know. And I'll show you some examples of this I have done before, and I'm hoping that I'm proven correct that it doesn't matter if the endometrium is ablated in patients who have endometrial involvement of the adenomyosis. Now here you can see an example. You can see this patient has got adenomyosis that has already penetrated into the endometrial cavity. When I ablate, I have reached. Let's wait and see whether these patients can get can conceive. So here you can see the, some of the challenges. This is a patient with something called global adenomyosis. You can see cystic areas. The adenomyosis is all around. And when you, when I do the ablation, and this is post uh, high food, this is the ablation. It's very difficult to control it, and and part of the endometrium will be affected. And if that happens, what is going to happen to this patient's fertility potential? And I can show you. An example of a hysteroscope that I've done for such a patient, the patient just now. This is the hysteroscopy done three months later. She's single. She's a doctor. She's about 38, 39, no partner. Then I put in a, a Mirina for her. So I took her to OT and I do a hysteroscopy. And this is how the hysteroscopy look. You can see that there is a normal area on this side and an ablated area on this side. You can see the, the necrotic tissue here. And I... I'm assuming, I'm hoping that this necrotic area will fall off. We can take it off and she will, this will also grow back and she will be able to conceive. Okay, now let's look at the group of patients with adenomyosis that we see. The first group are the one who does not want to get conceived. I like these patients because these are the patients that I can you know, enjoy my uh, ablation and let's ablate everything. Then comes the patients who want to get pregnant, those who want to conceive. And they are different, if divided into three groups. The first group is one who have frozen embryo, uh, already frozen. I like these patients. I'll tell you why. The second group are the ones who are single, still single. You know, I want to get pregnant. 38, 39, 40, I have adenomyosis. I want to get pregnant. What am I going to do with them? And the third one are the ones who want to get pregnant on their own after adenomyosis treatment. I don't like these patients because I don't know what to do with them. I'll explain to you why. And then there's the biggest one, unsure what to do. I'm not sure whether I want to conceive. This is, these are the 38, 39, 40-year-old single lady. They say that I have adenomyosis, I'm bleeding. Maybe I want to get pregnant. Maybe I don't want to. I don't know. You know, I, I ask them, what do you want? I am not sure. You know, tell me if you don't want, I will do a good ablation. And this is a very difficult uh, group of patients. Now, let, let me look at uh, the, let me see, I missed some slides here, I think. Okay, let me look at this. Those who have frozen embryo, uh, those who have embryo frozen. Now, these are the patients in which I have to be very careful to do the ablation. I must not involve the endometrium. I will give them GnRH analog for three months, and then I will do the embryo transfer three months after the high food treatment irrespective of whether the patient had got her menses. Now, why did I come to this conclusion? I've been doing it for about a year, and the earlier cases that I was doing high food for adenomyosis, I was telling them, okay, let's wait for your periods. When your period come, then we will do the embryo transfer. And what happened? The uterus starts growing back. 
uh, after completion of the of the high food treatment because we know that in adenomyosis when you're doing high food you will see when you come to my place we will be maybe doing 60 percent maybe 70 percent if we are lucky and the remaining 10 20 percent what is going to happen is going to grow back so when you do the ablation when we do the ablation and then we give them generation long at three months the uterus is the smallest and this is the best time to do the embryo transfer this is my theory i hope i can publish this in a, uh, this this concept now i'll show you a case study this is a lady madam clf she's 35 years old married for five years with no children she underwent IVF in 2019, had two frozen embryos, and she was given Gionarish analog. And in 2020, she underwent a laparoscopy. She was again given Gionarish analog for two months, and then she had an embryo transfer in 2021. It didn't, she didn't get pregnant. And uh, she complained of severe dysmenorrhea and heavy menses. She was on transamic acid to control her bleeding. Now she came to see me. Uh, examination showed a 16 week size uterus. Ultrasound showed a large posterior adenomyosis measuring 9.63 times 10 times 8.56 centimeters. And this is how it looks. Look at it, it's a large adenomyosis. You can see that it is, it's, it's a very large adenomyosis. And this is the transverse view of this, uh, this uh, uterus, you can see that the adenomyosis was more on the right side involving, almost uh, involving the endometrial cavity. So we did HIFU for her. And uh, this is the post HIFU. Uh, this is, a, I mean, for those who do HIFU, they will know this. Uh, I, I like to give maximum power 400, 146 seconds treatment. And uh, we, we gave it for 1,635 seconds. And uh, so three months later, this is how the uh, MRI showed we have ablated well. This one I did with my, with my teacher uh, sometime late last year, and it was quite good. So I sent her back to her, her and this is the transverse view of the MRI showing the ablation. So the ablation is fairly good, and the uterus is actually shrunk. It's about three months. So I sent her back to her high food special, uh, to her IVF specialist, and this is the ablation. Um, uh, this was, uh, you can see that this is at, uh, at, at the beginning, the volume of the uterus was 940 centimeter cube. And uh, one month later, it was 448. Three months later, it was 318. And about uh, seven months, six months later, it was 265. And this was a reduction of 71%. It's not the adenomyosis, but of the uterus. So I sent her back to a high IVF specialist and advised her to have an embryo transfer. Her IVF specialist did a CA125 and found that it was still very a bit high, 76.6. So she gave her another GnRH analog. And then she did the embryo transfer. She didn't induce bleeding. Uh, those who do IVF will know that there was no induction of bleeding. We just give Progynova and give her uh, utrogestin. And she's currently pregnant around 25 weeks. This is my first IVF uh, frozen embryo transfer. So in this particular case, I actually uh, waited for six months. So after this, my subsequent cases, I'm, I've start, decided that I will do it earlier. There's no reason to wait for six months uh, uh, to let it reactivate. This is another patient, also um, uh, uh, a very bad adenomyosis, posterior adenomyosis, ablation was done. And, and this is at three months. This patient is also pregnant. These are the two pregnancies I got after frozen embryo transfer for, uh, for high food treatment for adenomyosis. So, so high food patients with frozen embryo, the difficulty is to decide when is the best time to do that frozen embryo transfer. I've, I've asked Chong Ching to give me, but everybody is not very sure they are everybody is sure that you know when to put in the marina but not when to do the embryo transfer so i in my in my uh, practice i am giving generation analog for every patient who does adenomyosis treatment for three months and after three months um the, the reason why i give it for three months is, is included in my insurance bill i know in china they are giving it monthly so and after three months uh, the, and in my follow-up of these patients, the uterus is actually it's the smallest at this time, three, three to four months after the high food treatment. And it may be the best time uh, for, the, for the embryo to be transferred because after that, the, uh, the GnRH analog wins off, the other part of the un unablated uh, area may grow back. And so 
I'm currently doing frozen embryo transfer at three months post HIFU. So this is my, my theory. Now let's look at the next group of patients, those who are still single. Now what, I can, what am I doing with them? I also do a very careful ablation, not involving the endometrium as far as possible. I give them generational log, and then I ask the patient to take one of the following. Either they put in a Mirena, Dinogest, Depo Provera injection, continuous oral contraceptive or implant on. Now, Mirena is what I like, but many of my patients are Virgo in tech time. They don't want any uterine manipulation in this part of the world. So we have to go to other options. Dinogest is one. Depo Provera is actually a very good injection, but the the amount of suppression is pronounced. So uh, sometimes I don't use this as a first line treatment. Continuous oral contraceptive or implant. It's very important to give something because it will come back. I'll give you an example of one of my patients. This is a young girl, only 24 years old with severe adenomyosis. We did the ablation. This is one day after the treatment. And this is three months. The uterus was beautiful, it was small, and it was very nice. And the patient disappeared. So this was the volume of the uterus before the high food treatment. It was 382 centimeter cubed. At three months, it was 212, but she disappeared. And when she came back, and the reduction was 44%. And when she came back about eight months later, the uterus has grown back to 330. So it, is, it defeats the purpose of treating this kind of patients if you don't follow them up with some kind of suppressive uh, treatment. Now, next is those who are keen on spontaneous pregnancy. Now, this is a headache because we have young women who don't want IVF. We just want, it's very painful. I just want my high food. And after that, I want to try to get pregnant on my own. Now, this is a, this is a big headache for me because you still need to give very careful ablation, uh, not involving the endometrium. I give them GNRH analog for three months. And then I tell them that, okay, go and try to get pregnant. Try three months, six months. If you don't get pregnant, then we have to do something. We have to do IVF or we have to do something to, to help you to get pregnant. So I don't let them, you know, just drift away for a long, long time. I give you an example. This is a patient with a very large adenomyosis, posterior adenomyosis. I did the ablation as well as I could. I think some part of the endometrium may be involved. And this was at three months. It's come down very nicely. Now I'm waiting for her to get pregnant. I hope she gets pregnant. And here you can see the volume as reduction of 356 centimeter cube to 178 centimeter cube. And here I'm measuring the whole uterus volume because adenomyosis is very difficult to measure the, just the uterus. So it's the whole uterus volume. And the normal uh, uterine volume is average is about 80 centimeter cube. Okay, in conclusion, adenomyosis is a very difficult problem. It is more difficult when the patient wants to conceive. Uh, studies have shown that success rates in reducing menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea is up to 85%. Not all adenomyosis cases are the same. In some, ablation is easy. In others, it can be difficult. Those who are coming for training will see some of the cases that we do. Some can be really difficult, especially if there are lakes inside. These lakes are, are blocks for, for, treatment, uh, for, for, for the treatment of adenomyosis. And some respond very well, some just don't respond. And we have to, you know, we have to play around and see what, what to do with them. In women with adenomyosis who have difficulty in conceiving, especially after failed IVF, HIFU is a good option to shrink the adenomyosis before frozen embryo transfer. I like these patients because many of my IVF, many of my IVF specialists in the country, they have failed their IVF. And then they say, okay, now you go and see Selva, you may be able to do something for you. I like these patients because it's the last resort patients. They come to me and they get pregnant, I become famous. So I like, I like, I like this kind of patients, okay? There are many challenges in performing HIFU for these patients, including how much to ablate, how to avoid the endometrium. These are big challenges. And I'm still learning every day, what is the correct dosage of uh, energy I'm going to give at which point where it's, it's, a, learning, it's a learning curve. The next difficulty, as I said, is to decide when is the best time to do the embryo transfer. My suggestion is three months. I, I will be uh, running a case series and see that this is, this is the best option. Another option is to use a CA125 to decide, when, uh, to decide whether it's ready, the patient is ready uh, for transfer. So all my patients, I do a CA125 before, and then we will repeat it, say three months later, and see how is it. it's come down well, then they may be suitable for embryo transfer. So HIFU can also be done in patients with adenomyosis who want to conceive spontaneously, but she must be prepared to repeat the HIFU treatment if she did not conceive and the, and the adenomyosis recurs. This I keep telling my patients, you want to get pregnant on your own, 
wait one year you may have to come back for the next payment are you prepared for it if you are prepared for it i'll do it for you consider ivf early in these patients thank you i just want to share my experience of uh typhoon adenomyosis. In 2019, when Hong Kong first got the machine, uh, my patient is my patient, and she is uh, at that time 43 year old. She's been on this uh, adenomyosis for, she take the pills, the, the, the hormones for at least five years, she want to stop the hormone. So this, and then her, she, her main symptom is dysmenorrhea and menorrhagia, anemia, down to hemoglobin six. Yes. Yeah. And at that time, she don't want to remove her uterus, but she just want something treatment. And, and uh, so I, I told her about this high flu. And at that time, she done once. And then we give her uh, adjuvant uh, GnRH. But however, at that time, I'm, I'm very, I'm just trying to learning. So the Chung Jin, uh, my tutor, say, we should protect the endometrium even she do not want to get pregnant because uh, the theory is uh, because it's some necrotic tissue and if you burn the endometrium, there's high chance of infection. So I always um, think about this. So even she um, do not want to get pregnant and we save the endometrium and after it's, it's responding quite well and because we are giving GnRH post uh, the high food, but once the GnRH stop, her bleeding is come back again. And even the MRI um, saying that there's ablation, but you, you know, we save, we want to save the endometrium and it's not complete ablation. And it's also bleed torrentially after stopping. And then I just put in the Mirina and she seems okay. And then just like your patient, she disappeared. <laughs> and it's because she, that means that she's okay. She's uh, her symptom. In, in, and suddenly, I think just before I leave to here in, um, in uh, October this year, so it's about two years, she suddenly has the bleeding again, torrential bleeding. I think it may be the, she come back to me and the marina is still there, but um, she says it's a very heavy bleeding. And, and uh, so I, I give her another GnRH analog, but it didn't respond. And then suddenly she has uh, fainted at home and, and another doctor take care of her. And uh, then she they do the uh, DNC just to be sure it's not a change to malignancy because it didn't respond. And finally, and finally uh, it's a benign and she come back to me and we discuss the options, whether we, we high for again or this uh, UAE, because she still don't want to take, take out her uterus. But um, I think finally, before I leave, she said, I better do surgery because uh, it's so sudden. When they come back, the, um, it's very torrential bleeding. And I do the laposopic kiss for her because finally she agreed. Because I asked the UAE and say, uh, it's not good result even for adenomyosis, even the radiologists say like this. So, and, and I think I, I, I do the surgery and I found the uterus is very fibrotic. So I am just questioning, um, because you got diffuse adenomyosis and uh, even if she get pregnant, uh, one reason why she cannot stop the bleeding once uh, it will grow again, the uterus simply can't contract. Yeah, very fibrotic uterus. So I'm so I think maybe diffuse adenomyosis is a is anyway very difficult for pregnant. So um, I, as doctors, we have to try. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I, I, I totally fibrotic. agree. I totally yeah. agree with you. The bleeding part is a big big problem, and that's the reason why I'm saying that if the adenomyosis is involving the endometrium. I, and the patient doesn't want to pray pregnant, I will ablate as much as possible, uh, including the endometrial cavity. And then I'll put in a marina. I think that will give a better option of uh, preventing hysterectomy. That's, that's my feeling. But no, my is a difficult problem. Everybody knows. Uh, I mean, we all like to do the hysterectomy. You do the hysterectomy, I can go back and sleep. You see, you do, when I do haifu, I have to follow her up and 
you know, you know, listen to all her, all the, all the grumbling. But in infertility, where we see young patients, that's when the challenge comes in. Thank you for illustrative presentation. Uh, I, I face a problem with the patient with adenomyosis. Uh, the the difference between the expectation of the patient and what we can do, uh, because uh, the patient came uh, complaining from bleeding, pain. Uh, wanted to uh, conception and uh, and we I, I can uh, I make a I made a lot of conversation with her so what you said to your patient what is your expect the patient expectation regarding the results of the treatment yeah uh, the yeah you're right expectations are something that uh, we need to understand because we try to put adenomyosis, everything into one basket. It is actually many different diseases. Yeah. For example, the external adenomyosis will have bowel stuck to the uterus, and that may be the one that is causing the pain and not the adenomyosis itself. You may have adenomyosis with endotrioma. That's another group of patients. Then you have this internal adenomyosis coming from inside going up. So I think it's a it's different spectrum of disease. And sometimes we are putting them all in one basket and then telling them, uh, uh, trying to treat them similarly. So I, I do talk to the patient. I try and find out. I, have a, I, I explain a one patient with a, a very funny kind of adenomyosis. Uh, it is not, it didn't look big. It didn't look small. She wanted treatment and we did the treatment and she still got pain. And I said, I want the uterus out. And when I went into the uh, laparoscopically, the uterus didn't look anything. Her pain was somewhere else in the back or some, something else. Yeah. So there are many factors. So a lot of time is spent counseling them um, uh, on, on, uh, on, on their disease. So, but the, the patients who do not want to get pregnant is easy. We have got a solution. We can remove the uterus and your problem is solved. The problem comes is they don't want to get pregnant. And that's when the the problem comes in. I always have this dilemma as to which comes first. Should I do a laparoscopic surgery and release everything and then do HIFU for the adenomyosis or do adenomyosis and hope for the best and then do a laparoscopy later? This uh, debate that I, I have all the time. I give you an example. Just two days ago, uh, day before yesterday, I operated on a lady who has a 16-week size uterus, young lady, 36 years old, bilateral hydronephrosis because the, both the ureters were compressed bilateral endometrioma, and she came to me to do HIFU. I said, how can I do HIFU when you have bilateral uh, hydronephrosis? And she already was stented. So I said, I'm not going to touch HIFU to you. You'll blame my HIFU for the, for the treatment. So we went in laparoscopically and it was horrendous. I couldn't do anything. We put in a stent. We tried to release as much as possible. And I came back and said, actually, you need a hysterectomy. What do you want me to do? So I think, I think there are a variety of patients, and we need to you know, uh, kind of uh, discuss with them and then look for the best option for them. And they are different. Every patient is different in terms of, in terms of disease prevention, symptoms, and uh, pregnancy expectations. So they are a very difficult group of patients. Yeah. Fibroid you. is very easy. Yes, fibroid <laughs> is clear. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, um, I think Dr. Seva, we, most of us as reproductive medicine specialists will be eagerly awaiting your study three months, whether after three months to put it back, because I think we would have done the whatever first and then come back, treat the adenomyces, and maybe, like you say, the magic figure is three months. No, the, the magic figure is convincing them to do IVF before they come for the high food. That is the magic <laughs> treatment. So if anybody call me, with adenomyces, I said, have you done IVF? Have you got your embryos frozen? If you have your embryos frozen, then you come to me. Then I have a, at least some hope for you. Okay. Uh, there's no further question, even online. Thank you very much, Dr. Selva, for excellent talk.